Midkit, tell us just a little bit, if you could, kind of a five-minute version of you and your life story. What's your full name, and um, and what's your life story? My full name is Mitka Dmitry Kalinsky. This is the name. I don't know just how far I can go back. That's okay. <laughs> I don't know just how far I can I can go back. Uh, it began in 1939. Is it okay to say that far? When in Hitler invaded Poland, and uh, I wound out somehow from 39. I, I wound out in a Ukraine called Bila Tserkva, Ukraine. And uh, I was there two years, two winters. I did not know the years in those. I was too little, but I remember two winters. And, uh, and in 1941, when Hitler invaded Poland, that's my my problem started. The Germans came to the boarding school, and I uh, ran away from that boarding school. And I was picked up, and they sent me near Kiev, and they execute a lot of people in Kiev. I was one of them. And today they called Bobby Yar, and, uh, and and I was picked. I was picked up again. I was the only probably the only guy crawled out of the dead bodies, and I walked towards straight ahead. I see some people down there. When I got to those people, they were loading them in the cattle wagon, and they throw me along with them in the cattle wagon, and I wound out in Bergenau, and from from Bergenau. I uh, I had to work in a brick factory there, and I was too young to uh, to cut those bricks when they come out uh, still fresh uh, clay. So they made me uh, uh, on a horse, sit, made me sit on a horse in the back of the horse and go in the circles to mix the clay in a clay pit, what made the bricks out of it. And from there I went from from Bergenau I went to Buchenwald. I was in Buchenwald. And I saw people hanging, hanging down. They made us, they made, made us watch people hanging by the back of the hands, not, not front, back of the hands on a pole, high on a pole, till they died. And from Buchenwald, I went to Tachau, and, and I was in Tachau for a while. And then from Tachau, I went to Pfaffenwald. There was an experimenting camp deep in the forest, and uh, and the Nazi Nazi officer. Nazi officer came in December 14, 1942. He got me out of there for his own use, and I stayed with him seven years. Reason he needed a little boy is so I had to take a horse wagon and go six kilometers from Rodenborg on a Fulda to Bebra to pick up all the belongings. The, uh, that's, uh, and those, uh, I did not know in those years what they was all about, but now I know all those belongings that went in the experimenting camp, and, they, and the people never returned. And, tho- and those belongings, that's what I had to pick up and brought them back to Rodenburg on a pole to his place, and I had to sort them out, the, like uh, this goes here, that goes there, that goes there, and till they got so much that he called adult prisoners, and they loaded on the truck, and, and they took him down to the train station, loaded him in the wagons down, and he so, and took it down to Castle, and they sold it, all that stuff to his own government. So you were taken out of a concentration camp by a Nazi officer, turned into his personal slave, his family's slave, for seven years until years after the war. Who were your parents? What do you, what do you know about who your parents were? I didn't know anything about my parents. Only thing I remember, oh God, my beautiful mother, she put me in a crib, and she gave me a rubber band that you that you rubber band usually is round around a newspaper. But if you break one side of it up, and you take one side of it in between your teeth, and the other side in your hand, and then you start playing on it, and, and you, when you stretch out, it makes a different sound. And she gave me that in the crib, and I saw her walking out of the door, my bedroom door, beautiful long hair, and she closed the door. That's the last time I saw that lady, and I know she was my mother. That's the last time I saw her. And your father? And my father, I never knew my father, but through times, somebody 
uh, came to visit and he had a nice sports car and he had a patch over his eye and he carved me a boat that you that you put it in it like a little pond and the boat just just floats on it and then uh, uh, I, I remember that and, uh, and and then so many years later I mean that's a lot of years later turned out to be he was my father because I reunite with my two living half sisters uh, one half sister in London England they were liber liberated from Bergen Felsen that's the camp where Anne Frank died and I met her and, and confirmed all this what I just told you and so who was your father now, now, now uh, that you know now my father oh god my father I always been told from one prisoner that my father was above above Polish officer and he turned out to be he was a colonel in the Polish army from 1932 full, full colonel till 1939 in a town called Rovno that's a Polish Ukraine Rovno and I and I visit his grave in London, England. What's his name? What was his name? Is it, that's a Ladislav Kalinsky. Um, your time living with your time living with the, the German family. Um, where where did you live? What was the name of the town in Germany? And um, what was the best and what was the worst of what you experienced there? The town where I stayed in was called Rodenburg an der Fulda. That's between Kassel and Frankfurt. And uh, as far as the best, I don't know the best, but I tell you the worst. No food, no shoes for seven years, wore racks on my feet in winter and summer, wore bare feet on a, on a field and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, eaten, eaten raw potatoes. And uh, when I had to feed the pigs, the, they had the nice warm food. But before I give them the warm food, I got in first, and then, and then, and then, uh, and, uh, and that was my my meal. Where did you stay when you were living with uh, the the Durer family in Rotenburg? Well, they they had a room, uh, not not too not too far away from the from the stall where the horses are. And they had a bars on a window, and they closed me. They, they locked me up every night, and I had to sleep on. I had just a straw, straw uh, uh, bunk with a straw, and I had to. I shame to say this. I had to replace the straw every day because I was wetting, wetting my, my not my bed every every night, every morning. I had wet my bed, and I was not very light for them, for them to. Uh, to do all that stuff, and I, and I, and there was a was another thing. I don't know if I should say this or not. Their son was missing in Russia, and uh, and uh, once in a while they get a letter from 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 the east, bad news about about their son. So they took the anger on me by saying like this, while my son is missing in Russia, and here I had to feed his Judenfresser. So they called you a Judenfresse, a Jewish animal, sometimes. But they also gave you a German name. Um, what was that name, and why did they call you that? Well, that that I don't know. Soon, soon as I got there, they uh, changed my name completely. Everything I I knew, I forget the, everything that I knew, and they called me. Your name is Martin. From now on in, it's Martin. Only Martin. That's it. And and anything else, nothing. For seven years, Martin. And seven years later, when I was released in 1949, there was on a paper uh, uh, that found your name is Dmitry Kalinsky. And I don't, that name is so far away that they didn't even recognize. But the only name I recognized after Martin is Mitka. Mitka, I remember that, but I never been called that for nothing for seven years except Martin. Perhaps they called you Martin, so no one else in the town would know that you were Jewish. Um, but you learned to play music while you lived in Hortenburg, while, while you lived with the Dura family. How did that happen? Oh, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a happy and a sad. So, uh, uh, I'd said before, not happy, but this part uh, was happy. They sent me to work, and I had to go by 
uh, by by Nazis hove that would be a, a farm and when I, when I walked by there I hear such a beautiful music accordion music I dropped everything what I had in my hand and I had to go what the music was playing and when I when I got there some prisoner was had to, one of those button accordions he played that and uh, and I and I had to have that button accordion and somehow that that prisoner that played the accordion told me uh, if you if you can give me a half a pound of speck, that would be uh, like a, a salt pork. But this one here is a smoked smoked uh, a speck. It's, it's a, 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 a like a bacon. If you cut it and it slice, it would be bacon. And and uh, and I, I, he knew I had access to that. But uh, but uh, but that's a, that's the deal he gave me. So I had to go over there after he told me how to make a key skeleton key with a piece of wire you bend it you you bend it on one end of it and flatten it with a hammer uh, on the bottom and then and then turn on the other side turn it so you can put your put your thumb on it and turn it and and it worked and then when i wa when i walked to the nazi farm i op i i opened the door there and uh, with that skeleton keys, and I got into the smokehouse with what that speck was. How, what do I know about half a pound? I took the whole thing and I put it in my shirt, and then uh, closed the door, and I ran back to that to that uh, prisoner down there, and uh, give him that half a pound of speck, that whole slab, and he gave me the accordion. Now I had the accordion. Now I went back to that Nazi farm again. Now I have a problem. What am I going to do with the accordion now? So uh, my thought was I had to go in the back, from the back uh, uh, yard, and, and had a stationary ladder in the barn that goes clear up to the third loft. And I had to go, and, and I buried the accordion up there in the hay, and I came down and went back to the, to the prisoners where, where I was, and, and I was sent to, to go to work. And I picked up my what I dropped down on the ground, and I had to go to work, and this is how I got the accordion. And that was probably the nicest thing in my life because the, when I when I went to work in the field, long hours in the field, where do you think my mind was? It was on the accordion, and that kind of kind of cut the day short on me. What songs did you play on the accordion, and how did you learn those songs? Well, the, the first the first song I learned, they had the soldiers uh, from 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 one of the schools that was schools was converted to a prison, half of it and half of it Germans went to that school, and and uh, occasionally those soldiers they come in marching maybe like a, a 20 30 soldier at the time when they come into the town boy they march real sharp and they and they and they with a, with a with a what do you call it with a, with a cobblestone and and they had the horseshoe uh, cleats on their shoes when it, when I was marching you can hear them marching and they sung one of the German songs I can I can play that song on the accordion and I can sing it for you right here right now but I don't know the name of it I just found out today the name of it and uh, and, and that's this gentleman he has a he believe me or not he has something uh, somebody played on the accordion the same song that I learned. On the on the, on the button accordion, and it was not easy for me to learn. I had to play one note at a time, but I knew that song in my ear. I couldn't forget it, one because I got a good ear for a song, and I played it, and I and I finally made made the full song out of it, and I can still play it today for you. So you learned to play the accordion based on the German soldiers' songs, marching songs, as they marched along Cobblestone Street outside in the streets of Rodenborg. That's incredible. What, what, happened, uh, what happened to you, what happened to the family who was your slave masters as the war ended? Well, that, that, it was kind of confusion. When I, I didn't even know that, I don't even know who won that war. The soldier were in town, from little boy point of view, if the soldiers are in town, the war is not ended. So uh, who, who came, now I know, who came in that town was Belgium and Third Army, Patton Army, came in that town. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and, that, and that Nazi officer, he took off. He ran away before that. 
he, and then when, when he decided that uh, realized that he was in a Russian zone, right away he realized he better come back in American zone that would be he would be treated a little better. And when he moved, came back, snuck in in the town, the Belgium caught both of them, the Nazi officer and his buddy. And the other officer, was, the other Nazi officer, he was beaten to death with the butt of, butt of the rival. And they start beating on this other Nazi that had me for seven years. And they tell the uh, people with a white helmet, now I know, those are MPs, they stopped him. And they, and they uh, nursed him, and he was trialed in 1946 and send him to prison. But before he was sentenced, um, you were taken to the courthouse to testify on behalf of Gustav Dürer, your captor, um, who was accused of war crimes. What was that about? Why were you taken to testify on his behalf? That, that part there is a very, very sad thing, because his mother told me, now we must help Uncle Gustav because everybody's pointing finger at him, like it's all his fault, everything. And, I, and he, they told me, now we must help him. I even went so far and picked up the cigarette butts that the Americans threw out of the windows. They captured, they captured some of the buildings. And, and, I, and I got the tobaccos all together, and I, I rolled up as a cigarette. I even sent that cigarette over to him when he was captured and sent him to Melsungen. He was stationed there for a while kept him there before they sent him in a big big house. And, uh, uh, and and those Nazi family, I did not know in those days, they kept so close eye on me so I don't talk to anybody else. Had I talked to somebody else, big brother or something like that, he probably would have been in a Nuremberg trial. And when did you finally leave the Durer household and where did you, where did you go next? Well, I, de I stayed there till 1949. They kept, like I said, they kept real close. I didn't even know the war ended. Uh, they kept close, close eye on me. And uh, and uh, uh, what what was that quite the, the question? Where did you Where did you go next? Well, the, well the, the, I stayed with them till 19, like I said, 1949. And somebody must have reported to the to the authority. There's a boy down in, in that in that house does not belong in there, and I was the the, the soldiers the Patton Army came to that house and got me out of there, and the, and they sent me to Rod House, and they hold me there for a while till the international uh, IRO, IRO IRO UNRWA IRO UNRWA in 1949, uh, the, they sent me to to Hanau that would be near Frankfurt, and from Hanau they sent me to Bad Eibling. That was my first freedom right there. And when you, when you finally came to the United States, uh, where were you sent and what did you do? Oh, I came, I came to the United States, and I, I, now I know there was in the Bronx, in the Hans Point, and that there was a, a Jewish temple down there. There was a lot of kids down there, and I was one of them down there. And they were they were uh, uh, bleeding for for other charities come and and uh, and they helped them out to take some of these children off their off their arms off their off their backs down there because they had too many of them down there. So Catholic Catholic charity came and picked me up and sent me to Baltimore, Maryland, and I stayed there. They they gave me, they gave me a place to stay, Social Security card. They sent me a, a, a set me up with the jobs, and. Uh, and, and, and I stayed there till 1953. And when you came to the Bronx at first, you didn't speak any English. How did you begin to learn your English? <laughs> that's a, that's a, you, you would never believe this, that the English began when I started going to the movies. And I, then Hans Point, that they had a lot of movies, uh, theater in those years. They had four movies in one theater, and, and you, if you had 25 cents, you can stay there 24 hours a day, believe me or not. And that, that's what happened to me. And through the movies, I learned how to speak English. What were your favorite films? What were your favorite movies that you saw? Oh, it, well, in, 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 those, in, in those years, uh, when, 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 I, when I arrived, well, in, in Bronx, there was a lot of Western movies, uh, you know, like uh, 
those old stars, in those years they were not all stars. Today, like Tom Mix and all that stuff, you know, and uh, and probably Hopalong Cassidy and this. But when I went when I went to Baltimore, the favorite movies was like Samson and Delilah, and that and and then uh, uh, Shane it came up, and then Showboat, the the, the movie, you know, and all, all those all those beautiful. My heart was just filled full of music, with Doris Day, with the all by the Broadway, and all this. Oh, it was just beautiful. I wish I can repeat that all over again. And then you met your beautiful, this beautiful woman who'd become your wife, Adrian. Adrian, can I can I ask you a few questions? Maybe. So, Adrian, how did you and Mitka meet? When and how and where? We met in North Tonawanda, New York, and he applied for a job at a, at a plant where I was working in the office, and he got a job as a fork drift, forklift driver, and he got it by going to a house that was near there <clears throat> that had a swastika on the porch, uh, cut out of the wood on the base of the porch. And when he got the application to work there in ADSCO, he took the application and went to that house hoping that they would help him to fill it out, which he did, or they did for him. They were happy to help him because they were German. And that's how he got a job at ADSCO, and that's where we met. And how did he break the ice? What happened on your very first date? Uh, well, he had, he'd been driving that forklift up and down in front of my office window for I don't know how long, a while. And uh, we were both flirting, I admit it. <laughs> he reminded me of Tony Curtis. <laughs> and... Uh, when I went out of work that afternoon, or not, uh, off work, he was waiting by the gate, and in broken English, he wanted to walk me home. And he, uh, he bragged a little bit, didn't he? Didn't he brag about something? <laughs> yes, he did. Uh, after we dated a few times, he he uh, told me he was making $150 a week, and then he asked me what I was doing there. And I said, I worked in payroll, and then he knew his goose was cooked. <laughs> well, didn't you tell me at first that he didn't know what the word payroll meant, and he asked, right. what does payroll mean? And you said, I'm the person who writes your checks. That's right. <laughs> so he was trapped. Put the money in the envelope for you. <laughs> the big cash. So you married, and, and not long after, you moved out to Nevada. But, I mean... In those early years, what did you know about Mitka's war stories? Um, how much did you know, and what did you think was he was going through, he had gone through? I knew nothing. Uh, as far as I could make out, he had an Oma and Opa and, an, and a Tanta Anna, and that's all I really knew. Until 28 years after we'd been married, 28 years, he finally told me about his life and that's when we started trying to search and retrace steps and find records and what why did he wait until why did he wait so long to tell you and when 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 and why did it finally come out when it did I think he waited so long because he was em, uh, embarrassed and ashamed of his life didn't want me to know about how horrific those years had been for him and uh, he finally told me when when then President Reagan had zapped all the disabled off the disability Social Security and Mitka had always been a very proud man never wanted me to work after we were married just wanted me to raise the kids at home and uh, uh, he finally said, Mom, sit down. I've got something I've got to tell you. First, Hitler took everything away from me, and now your president is taking everything away from me. And so then he started telling me about his past. What was your reaction? 
attraction. Uh, what was your reaction when you heard this? And then what, what did you do? What steps did you take? The first thing I did, and I, I remember vividly, it was a Saturday morning. And the first thing I did was call a rabbi. And he was rather short in the beginning and just said, call back next week and make an appointment. Because all I had told him was uh, that my husband was a Holocaust survivor and I felt he needed to talk to a, a rabbi, you know. And I, he kind of put me off, call back next week, but I did, made an appointment. And we went in and sat in his office, and my husband just unloaded everything on him. It was like a, the world was lifted off of his shoulders once he told the rabbi all of this about his past. And then the rabbi told us to make another appointment for the following week, which we did. And we went back. And he had a conference phone set up on his desk in the temple. And he said, we're going to call that Nazi. And he had a, a university uh, professor there, professor of German there. And he had, and he wanted the, the professor to question this Nazi uh, because Mitka was, he was trembling that he would dare to question this Nazi that had kept him for seven years and that he did he questioned him what happened then after the phone call what happened um, what, was the, what was the next step you took uh, the next step what did we do no the first thing he did was apply for a for a United States that was what the professor was asking the Nazi for. He said he, Mitka needed this information about his past, where he had gotten him, how old he was, and what he knew about his family, everything, and and claimed that Mitka needed this to get his citizenship. And so as soon as we worked on that, we tried to get the rabbi had told us about the Jewish uh, survivors getting uh, quite a good settlement from the German government and he helped us to apply but there was no records to confirm where my husband had really been imprisoned or anything else and he was turned down every step of the way he didn't didn't meet the criteria and uh, so I he was eventually put back on uh, we had a, we got an attorney and he he uh, I don't know, he just he talked to a judge and the judge reinstated my husband onto the social security rolls and we we got uh, what amounted to twenty five hundred dollars, five thousand Deutschmarks from the German government and we used that money and took a trip to Germany to try to retrace his steps in Rotenburg and intending to go to Erlson and see if there was any records but we didn't get past Rotenberg, but we did make more contacts there and through that. And then one step at a time, we got to this point. Mitka, did you get to meet Gustav Dürer again when you returned to Germany? That that was my my wish. When when I talked to to him in a rabbi's office, he said he had records that he's going to send to me. And uh, but he hasn't. So we went when we went to Germany in 1984. Uh, first thing we hit, at uh, uh, we thought maybe he can he can tell me all this. But he had died three months before we got there. So I spoke to his sister. I said, Anna, I spoke to your brother from America, and he said he had some records down in a basement, and uh, and uh, she says to me. Well, if you spoke to him and he said he had some records in a the basement, then you must get it from him. So, and that everything went down the tubes. And it it was crushing that 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 Gustav was no longer there, that he was no longer living. You you had wanted to see him. Was that so you could wring him up by the neck and and uh, 
and get revenge for what he had done to you? What, what, or why was why uh, why were you disappointed not to see him? Well, before I left the United States for Germany, I contacted Simon Wiesenthal, and I and I liked and I wanted for his advice. I've gone into a Nazi's nest because Bud Hersfeld and Rodenberg on a folder as a Nazi's nest then and Nazi's nest today. And I got a beautiful letter from him, from Simon Wiesenthal, that says, don't go in there with the hate, go in there with the smiles. So this is what we what we go on. on. We, went up, we went up with the smiles. So when I found out that Gustav had, had passed away, only thing I want out of those people is to find out what what happened to my family? How did I, I arrived in that place? Maybe they could tell me, but instead, when Anna says, "Well, uh, if you spoke to Gustav and he says he has records, get it from him," and he died three months ago, so that was dead end from me to uh, to uh, to deal with her. But you you were told by Simon Wiesenthal to go in with kindness. Did you have only hatred for this family, or did you have more complex feelings? I, uh, I didn't have no hate for this family, and I, and I, and I still say it to you. Maybe everybody can can listen what I have to say. To able to hate anybody, somebody's going to have to teach you to hate. Who taught me to hate? Nobody taught me to hate. Only thing, only thing I, I was taught: if I don't behave myself, they would. They would uh, take me back to Pfaffenwald. This is the kind of life that I had to live. Uh, and, uh, but, but you to, able to hate. I, I didn't. I still today. I don't hate anybody. But, but if I knew, if I somehow knew, somehow, somehow knew that somebody killed my mother, that person, I might change my mind on that question. What do you know about your mother today? You know about your father. What, what do you know about what happened to your mother? This is what we are trying to try to find out. If I have any chance, I like to go to Poland. I like to invite everybody to go and help me out on this, because there must be somehow, somewhere in 1939, what they what they burned people. My mother was burned alive in 1939. There must be some places. Somebody has to. Somebody somebody going to have to show me where was that burning, uh, you know, and that this hasn't been done yet. Uh, I'm not I'm not a wealthy person to to invite everybody, but I sure like to invite everybody on this to go to Poland and share this with me. So after the trip to Germany, um, there was another breakthrough in the 1990s in terms of retracing your past. What happened? What happened in the 90s? Well, we in uh, 1993 we <laughs> we had a chance to be a camp host here in our favorite spot, Bodega Bay, California, and uh, and, some, and somebody uh, uh, recommended to Sonoma County that we know we know a couple, my wife and myself, Adrian and me, and uh, to be a camp host because we were always so so friendly and everything. So and we got the job in 1993 uh, uh, being a camp host here, and that's where our our luck began. Uh, little by little, we met a lot of people all over the world. They come in over here because they made the movie The Birds, and they all want to know what what this is all about. So, when 1994 uh, 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 came up, we met we met a, a ham radio operator. There were the whole bunch of hammer hammer operators here at Bodega Bay, and they. Uh, and this one particular one, I went over to him, and, and uh, he had a big antenna. And I said, boy, I looked at the antenna. I said, too bad this antenna does not go to Russia. And he said, Russia? I just hung up with somebody talking uh, with Russia. That's a ham radio we're talking about. So I, and my ears went straight up to him, and I said, uh, I thought maybe this guy could help me. And he, he wanted to, too. So I quickly ran to my wife and said, hey, write, write my name and everything down on a piece of paper. Which he did, and I gave it uh, to to, uh, to to guy named as Gary Nix, and I gave it to him, and he uh, and he started searching on me, and believe me or not, in the side of, side of one month, Adrian, what did we found? We found everything. We we, uh, we found, we found uh, 
pictures, photographs, 8 by 10 he sent to us of the actual boarding school that Mitka had been in right before the Nazis took him. And 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 that boarding school, what uh, we were we were we were kids, but we were told that something going to happen. That that year is 1941. That there's something going to happen in a month's time. But what, what is a month's time? But anyway, months come, months come, time came. Five bombs dropped during the night, and the next morning, we we uh, kids we went up front. All the adults were gone, and uh, and I seen those trucks pulling out front of the gate, and I have the pictures here, uh, uh, to, right there at the front of that gate where I got the pictures, and uh, another boy and I, we made a left turn, and we went across the river to try to find our teacher, because we knew she lived across the water, but where we did not know, and that, and, and uh, we, we tried to find her, we kept on walking, we never did find the teacher, and I was picked up, and with the sent me down to uh, near Kiev. Today they called it Bobby Yard that executed so many thousands of people down there, and I was one of them. And Gary Nixon also helped you learn who your father had been, yes. um, Colonel Kalinsky. You, uh, and then you you saw his gravestone, didn't you? How did that happen? What was that like? Well, I went in nineteen. 95, when they, America celebrated, or the world, I should say, celebrate 50 years defeat Germans. And somebody somehow told San Francisco, uh, there's a survivor here at Bottega Bay, California. And about six channels came over here and interviewed me over here uh, about that, searching for my family. And then, uh, and, and when that went, there's uh, one, one channel here, a channel, uh, KGO, Liad Melinda. She went, she interviewed me here, but when she uh, interviewed me, when she found out later that uh, Gary Nixon had found my family through through a video, uh, that we have a living sister in London, England, and she jumped right on it. She wanted to 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 take us right now tonight with him, and that's what she did. We reunite with my sister, and and on top of it, and my sister says. My, your father is buried right here too. So we and I went over there. Oh gosh! And I seen my father's grave. And then later, a few years later, you reclaimed your Jewish heritage. Um, what was that like? What ha what happened in 2001 in New York City, and what did that mean for you? Well, one one led to another. Uh, Steven Spielberg, the the shower that got involved in this. And they called me a few times right here at Bottega Bay, and I hung up the phone on, on that on that deal, because I don't like to talk on the phone on the, something like that. But anyway, when when I got back home, that person came to to Sparks, Nevada, from Steven Spielberg, and the one that interviewed me, and uh, which which I accepted because her voice was nice and she was very nice, polite, and she interviewed me for 12 hours, and. Uh, and then when when she went back to Long Island, New York, they told the rabbi in Mineola there's somebody here in Sparks never been bar mitzvah. And that boy, the rabbi, called me right away and says, uh, Mitka, don't worry about it. Just just he he sent me prayers over 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 a phone, told me some prayers, and then he sent me a letter to study some of the prayers. But I cannot read and write, and that's and that's what when he meant by that. Uh, don't worry about it. Oh, he was so warm, warm friend for Rabbi. Uh, and uh, and uh, they uh, paid a trip, my wife and I, to Long Island, New York, in 1901, and it's uh, to, to, to 2001. And I've been par mitzvah in Long Island, New York, and that's uh, uh, you can find that on the internet, the Guide Post, Washington Post, New York Post, and all that places down at uh, Jewish Week, Jewish Press, and everything. So you reclaimed your Jewish heritage by being bar mitzvahed as an as an older man, um, and on that trip you also went down to Lower Manhattan and looked out at the Statue of Liberty and had a few words for her or with her. What were those words that you shared with the Statue of Liberty? When I visit, there's a Holocaust Museum right nearby Lower Manhattan in Padre Park, and I was up there, and I happened to be alone there, 
there was a big window, and there was a bench sitting right next to the window. And I sat down and I looked at that statue there, looked at that lady, and I and I told my my to that lady, to myself, when I came here in 1951 and I saw you, I did not know who you were, and now now that I I sit here now I I know who you are and 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 uh, and uh, and uh, the whole and I just got choked up. Last question, because it's getting really cold here. I know. Um, why is your story so important? And uh, uh, you know, what can people learn from your story? Well, that that uh, that I don't know. I just I just like to uh, like I'm telling when I when I speak to the class to the kids, uh, just telling them how how glad you are to have mother and father here to to care for you being in school something that I never had any chance uh, to, to do that and I, I just try to tell that kids if you disgruntle with you like many kids say I hate your mother I hate your father I like to tell that kid then give them to me you you father and and I just I just want the kids to know uh, that uh, how 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 lucky they are to 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 be with with uh, with their families and 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 have a school education, yeah, which I never had any. It's just shameful for me to tell you, grown man like me, to tell you I cannot even write my own name. <laughs>